All right, this is Masters of Podcasting. My name is Melissa. I'm Conley. And today we're going to talk about the final episode of season one, Man High. Elvis has left the building. Or yes, by its by its uh, also known as alternative title. By its internet title? By its internet title. So this episode starts out um, with people getting ready for big changes. Yeah, I really like Bill's quote uh, when he's opening the presentation. He talks about just in general language why he thought it was necessary to do this study. And he talks about how you can't take people's word on sex because it ends up being lies, half-truths, delusions, and significant omissions. And what have we suffered from all season? (laughs) Gee... I wonder. What has Bill been up to all season? Hmm, significant omissions. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a very good way to put basically the theme of season one, and I guess kind of the uh, hard, cold reality of the way Bill treats Jenny in general. Well, I think the way that Bill has approached this entire enterprise, really, because his firing comes as such a shock to him, even though the handwriting is so clearly on the wall. It's like he can't even understand what's happening and why his genius is not being recognized until they're in Fitzhugh's office and, you know, the chancellor's just screaming at him. Yeah, he can't even begin to comprehend that. And on one level, yeah, you know, he's he's a privileged white male, top of the pyramid. But on the other, I do feel sorry for him. I mean, he doesn't, he's trying to, you know, usher in this new age and he just gets so cruelly shot down. But then again, he did take the shock approach to get everyone's attention. So it's not like you can't say that he didn't bring this on himself a little bit. (laughs) And I thought it was funny, too, that not only did his size matters research, in quotation marks, but Mm -hmm. that went off without a hitch, and it was the film that really screwed him over. Right, and and you could even say that, you know, even though the, the size study was so small, they spent a lot of time talking about the film stuff. You know, that, that was an arc that spread across several episodes, and they put quite a bit of um, work into that. Maybe they didn't have the same, maybe they also suffered from the same small sample size, but it was a far more fleshed out part of the, the study that just got totally shut down right out of hand. Well, and I guess Libby has a point when she's talking to Bill afterwards saying, you know, why didn't you show me the film? I would have told you. It's a little shocking. Yeah. I mean, because now, you know, we see things like that on billboards. But at the time, I think it's hard for us to put ourselves in that sort of position where, you know, none of that material was available as readily. Obviously, it was available and you could get it, but it wasn't exactly as prominent as it is today. Well, and it really it really calls into light the fact that we've been on this arc with Bill and Jenny throughout the season, sort of getting desensitized to the notion of watching people engaged in sexual activity. And then, so it's almost like we're sort of in on the study ourselves as the audience. Yeah, it's a good way to make us outraged on their behalf and sort of confused at the I guess, ignorance of the other doctors. I think it's telling, too, that the point when the plug gets pulled is uh, the film, obviously, but when Bill is making the particular point that women have capabilities that are vastly superior to men, and that is when Fitzhugh just cannot even. Yeah, and I, to me, that was directly connected to Lillian's earlier conversation with Fitzhugh, because she comes up to him and she's going to make this big pitch to him she wants the same sweetheart deal and he essentially tells her you're a woman no one wants to hear about how you are just as good as a male doctor no one wants to hear this you're not going to get the same deal you're not going to get the same attention from me so just cut it out and he has the exact same reaction so I think her her being shut down so summarily is almost a foreshadowing of how badly the presentation is going to go and it's it's also a little ironic too because she goes into that particular meeting with Fitzhugh saying, Virginia, you were right. I should not be complaining about Bill Masters. I should be emulating him. Excuse me while I go bug the chancellor. And then, you know, unfortunately she, uh, she, she just doesn't get what she wants. It doesn't, it doesn't work the way she thinks it's going to. Well, she gets shot in the foot and then later Bill, God of obstetrics, gets completely shot down. So it's a nice little circle, I think. Uh, Jenny's post-presentation reaction was interesting, don't you think? It was. Um, I, I guess it was hard for me to tell whether that was 
it, it looked like she was going to bust out crying in the elevator. And so I guess my question was, was it only because this footage got shown and, you know, there was already talk that it was her or it was because said footage shut down the study that she had worked so hard to, to get on the ground. Yeah. It's, she's drawn as such a, such a mysterious character. Sometimes it can be hard to uh, make direct associations between influences in the storyline and exactly what she's so upset about but you could you could get the feeling that it was it was a dual level thing it was almost like a raging conflict inside of her she could have been humiliated and and embarrassed on behalf of the study like as as a former member of the team that put the study together and seeing it just go down in flames while at the same time it could be outrage and just anger and betrayal over having her body projected up on a screen and just the fact that he put her up there without her informed um, intelligent consent yeah without any consultation whatsoever right Let's go back a little bit to the beginning and talk about Ethan and Ginny at the very start of the episode. I think it it made me laugh that um, here Ethan's going away to you know be on his big interview out in California. He's making a big cross country plane trip, and he and Ginny have what looks like the least satisfying sex of the season for her anyway. For her anyway, because she's you know. She's just got this look on her face. Sex is happening to her. It's like she's sex adjacent. It is It is happening in the general area, and there is no change of expression on her face. I think that was kind of a, uh, I will throw my boyfriend, who will soon be 3,000 miles away, a bone here. Yeah, yeah. It's just kind of like, yep, this is a thing, and now it is happening. It did, it did strike me as funny that... Um, in the past, Jenny has rated the missionary position as a 4 out of 10 on uh, how much she likes it. And then in one of the, I think it was like episode 9, you get a flashback. She's on her back and she's having a great time with Bill. And then here she is back in the missionary position with Ethan and she's just got like this dead expression on her face. That's just like, Ethan, do you not see the writing on the wall? Like, do you not know what is happening? He's just off in his own little land of delusions. Land of delusions and significant emissions. Um, Also, early in this episode, we start to get rumblings that Jenny is uh, a little dissatisfied with the way, I guess the slow rate that things are happening uh, with Lillian's study. And she starts to kind of chatter and talk about expanding and going into other work and doing other stuff and Lillian just looks at her and says you know I don't have much time left this is all I've got if I can focus on one thing that's okay with me she's she's okay with doing less than glamorous you know more honest goals and that's totally okay and I think it's interesting the way she phrases it because Ginny is looking to do something revolutionary and just wild and very ambitious and Lillian obviously doesn't share those same goals but I I, I wonder if it's if it's equal parts exhaustion from having given so much of herself to medicine only to be conflict like she's gone the proper traditional route right and she's done everything that she's supposed to do and she is still no closer than she was probably five years ago or what however long ago but then at the same time she's also tired from the cancer you know she doesn't she's it's I don't think it's that she's not as ambitious as Ginny is I think Ginny is just almost in a luckier set of circumstances in a way from not like, she doesn't have the same privileges as being a doctor that Lillian does, but that sort of insulates her in a weird way, I think, from, from like, truly accepting and making real in herself the criticism that she gets from others. That's not to say that she's not affected by outside criticism, but it's like she's so revolutionary and such a rebel that she can just shrug her shoulders and say, well, fuck them. I don't care, and I'm going to do whatever the hell I want. Whereas Lillian is so inculcated in the system that she's more likely to take it personally. And I think, too, their ambition manifests in such different ways. You know, Lillian is so singularly focused, whether it's because of her circumstances, because she has cancer and she knows she can only accomplish a finite amount of things in a certain amount of time. And Ginny, meanwhile, has this, I don't, I I wouldn't call it naive, but maybe 
younger sort of optimism where she just sort of looks out and sees the world in front of her, you know, thinking, I can get my degree, I can be a research assistant, I can do this groundbreaking study with this very, you know, amazing doctor who I may or may not have feelings for. You know, it's just kind of everything is in flux for her in a way that it can't be for Lillian. Very real doors have started to close on Lillian, and even though Jenny has had obstacles in her way, she doesn't have the same, like, the universe is slamming doors in her face kind of situation. Well, and it, not to get back to Mad Men, but to get back to Mad Men, <laughs> it's very much a, a Joan and Peggy situation, you know. Here are two women who could be equally ambitious and who are traveling down similar roads, but one of them happened to be born a few years later than the other, and because of the, you know, something that's seemingly very random and unfair, more doors are open. Yeah. Uh, it's also, I noticed that uh, Jenny, after uh, the presentation is completely botched, she comes in and she couldn't sleep last night, so she picked up a journal and she read all this new stuff that's going on in obstetrics. Her coping mechanism to feeling so awful generally about the presentation is to just go into manic work mode like she can't focus she can't stop and focus and process how this is making her feel she just has to charge on ahead into something and that's that's a very interesting thing given how we're constantly told that Jenny is the more humane of the Masters and Johnson pairing and she's more in tune with emotional stuff like she she has a lot of moments where she tries to detach herself to continue focusing on something cold and logical. And it's interesting, too, that you point that out, because I think, at least in this episode, Lillian comes off towards the end as being the more emotionally attuned person in that particular partnership, because in the midst of the presentation and then in their conversation afterward, you know, first she sticks up for Jenny by asking Bill, you know, you keep saying we, who's we, and then... When Ginny is going on her manic trip down whatever lane, Lillian reins her in and says, look, I don't have a lot of time. I can tell you're upset, but this is the work that I need to do and that you can help me with. Yeah, and that's that's interesting that Ginny can be both humane and lo- like coldly logical. She can, she can be both of those things. She doesn't just have to be one of them. Mm-hmm. I love that, actually. Me too. So let's talk a little bit about Barton and Margaret. Life on Mars. <laughs> did did David Bowie start playing in your head when you heard that line? <laughs> it did. A little you know bit. Me so well. <laughs> oh, I, interesting the way that um, Margaret's visit to the doctor goes because obviously they're talking about the different types of gay conversion therapies which were popular in this time for many years afterwards. So at the end of the conversation, the doctor, the way that he phrases their situation is like some sort of fatal diagnosis. You know, your husband can beat this, Mrs. Scully. You know, we, we just have to get ahead of the, the game. It is a testament to Margaret's character that despite everything, she pulls back from the brink. Like a couple of episodes, she was like, oh yeah, I'm going to get a divorce. It's going to be great. She pulls back from the brink of that, and not only does she say, we can work something out, like we, you know, maybe we can still make this marriage work, it's, she is sort of starting to go in the direction of, I really don't want you to change anyway. Like, I think she came close a couple of times to just being like, just be who you are. I think that was what was most impressive about this arc as a whole, and about both Barton and Margaret, you know, within the show, and then the way that Alice and Janie and Bowbridges play off of each other, that they can really wrap up all of that fondness and admiration and love for each other around what, in any show, but especially in this show, is just such a fraught and terrible and scary situation. I don't know, it was one of those things, just the way that this arc wrapped up in this episode, it reminded me why I grew to like this storyline above most of the others this season Hmm. and I also have some theories about how this will impact season two even though both Allison and Bo are committed to other shows but ah yes we can talk about that later yeah um what should we go on to next um do you want to talk about Bill and Libby for a minute or do we want to talk about Barton and Bill I'd like to save Barton and Bill because of what happens during the firing okay so let's talk about Bill and Libby. Um, she, uh, 
Gosh, she's such a lovely presence in this episode, you know, desperately, you know, trying to support him. Well, I can whip up a nice planter's punch. It'll be fun. We'll, we'll have a great time. And he's just, he's getting to be so nervous and panicky that he's just like, no, martinis. It has to, set, it has to, it has to be treated seriously. And she's like, well, does that actually require alcohol? No, 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 it does. It does. They have to be drunk. You don't understand. Yeah. Uh, but the fact that she steps up and says outright during their sadly failed dinner party, he should have shown her the footage. You know, she could have told him, yeah, obviously, no one is going to accept this. This is a terrible idea. Right. Um, I keep thinking about how she brings up Virginia, but it's not even in an accusatory way. It, then Libby just sort of says out loud, I don't know why she would compromise herself like that. That sort of seemed like a subtle shift, didn't it? Yeah, because like, out of all the reactions for that particular conversation, you wouldn't imagine something like empathy. It would either be, oh, no, you're probably right, or, well, it's definitely her and I hate you. Well, see, no, what I meant was, uh, what's the line she says, um, well, the doctors around me thought it might be Virginia. It, it's almost like concern. Like, well, it wasn't really her, was it? You know, uh, is she is she going to get in trouble or something? But then he he waffles and kind of distances himself from it. And all of a sudden, her line, uh, she wouldn't compromise herself. That read to me like kind of accusatory. I can see it as being accusatory, but it's almost... I mean, it's very passive-aggressive. Like, it's kind of suspicious, but I, maybe it's because he just won't tell her, and she just, I don't know, just is lashing out in a weird way. so defensive. Like, mm -hmm. you know, she says Virginia, and then he's like, what the, what the, Virginia? What? <laughs> and then, of course, you know, she's going to latch onto that. Yeah, he can't be cool about it, and I think she catches <laughs> on to that and is like, oh, really, huh? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, if he hadn't gotten so flustered, it probably would have been fine. Except poor Bill, oh. his feelings are not his own. He, he he can't he can't be cool on any level. <laughs> he just can't. Do we want to talk about? Well, let's talk about Bill and Barton now. Um, okay. Since that gets into uh, sort of the before the firing, but just after the presentation, um, Bill and Barton are outside walking around, and Bill just has this like full body reaction like he's just pacing back and forth and he's like a like a wounded horse in a stable just kicking and throwing pitching little fits and just not having a good day he is having a no good very bad awful day and Barton just like calm down buddy no one is like no one is here to hunt you down just calm down I've always been on your side and it's uh it's a nice little bonding moment but then it's hilarious because Barton comes out and says, well, I don't like the narrow-mindedness of the system. Fuck them. And Bill takes a couple minutes and then he goes, yes, fuck them. Has to be proper about it. His snooty little, yes, I agree. I like well, that. Well, and I love that the tie between Bill and Barton is still so strong that even though in the beginning of the episode, Bill can't admit, Barton, I want you to come to my presentation. I need you there. I want my dad to show up to my <laughs> school play. I just want my daddy to be proud of me. <laughs> exactly. So, so we go from that to this where Bill's just freaking out and Barton is actually being the father figure and Bill is too wound up to really appreciate or notice it. That was cute. Oh. So then we get into Jane and Lester getting super close. Oh, I just love how, how protective she is of him. You know, he's terrified that his signature film style will give him away. <laughs> Lester's amazing and and Darling. MVP of the season. They are just like adamant, you know. Jane is just filled with fiery rage. She's just like, I will tell everyone. I will tell everyone. I will defend you. It is science. Barton and Bill have a very tense conversation in his office while Bill gets to stand in his moody little brooding spot looking out onto an alley with some trash cans, one imagines. At his thoughtful window. His thought is his thinking window, yes. <laughs> and uh, he can't even comprehend, like he can't even begin to comprehend the idea of being fired. Like it doesn't even enter into his universe. He is just bowled over, like, what? It's funny because obviously he was expecting, not retribution, but some kind of fallout from this terrible presentation that went wrong. But I guess in his mind it was only going to be a kind of slap on the wrist, like, 
you showed a naughty film. Don't do that again. Or like what happened in real life, which was that it took eight, you know, ages, months and months for the furor, furor, whatever, the, 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 the anger to build up in the hospital until he was finally, I think he was stripped of his tenure and he was like kind of, um, I, I, it makes me think of Mr. Banks in Mary Poppins, you know, kind of dressed down in a way, but still allowed to keep his job. Oh, yeah. You know, but eventually he just got so fed up with having his freedom and his uh, his sweetheart deal restricted and taken away from him that that was what made him go out into the world and seek a different situation. But here it's so definitive. I, d- I did like that Bill came up with the plan to save Barton on his own. And that it takes a while for Barton to catch on to what the hell's going on. And I thought that was a great twist, especially because, you know, all season Bill has been the robot, the one with not human feelings. And, you know, the conversation they have in his office right before they walk into what would have been both of their firings, Barton is in the corner kind of going on what could become some sort of despondent, suicidal thought train. You know, you're a young man. You'll, you'll land on your feet. It's over for me now. Leave me here to die. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Push me out on a raft into the icy waters and let me die. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's. I liked that Bill was able to pick up on that to the degree that he just is sitting there listening to Fitzhugh scream and goes, you know what? Barton's not going to get fired over this. It, it, on rewatch, um, it... Not that I thought this directly, but there's a moment in Bill's office when Barton picks up Bill's coat and hands it to him. The the expression on Bill's face almost kind of makes me, it, it could be one of like, this is the start of a caper. <laughs> this is our Ocean's Eleven moment. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Did the whole firing scene strike you as pretty awkward? Because it struck me as 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 stilted and very theatrical and it was amazing that Fitzhugh did not pick up on how obviously fake it was. I think Fitzhugh was just so angry and so seeing red he would not have recognized subtleties in any sense. Probably not. I feel Fitzhugh like Fitzhugh seeing red, I, Bill being a terrible actor. Yeah, Bill being a terrible actor. Um which is funny given that he he walks through life being, you know, wearing a different face than the one that he normally, you know, that his true authentic self is buried down deep under all this the great Bill Masters, MD. Uh, let's bounce back to Jane and Lester again, because we can't seem to stop, sh- or I can't seem to stop shunting between this and Bill and Barton. So Bill gets fired, and Jane says that's like firing God. And then she and Lester have a lovely moment. And Jenny walks in and is absolutely mortified that they are kissing and having this lovely, intimate, very personal moment. And given that she's spent several of the last months, you know, of, of the last year watching people in very compromised, vulnerable sexual situations, it, it's, it's very telling of her commitment issues, I guess, of her problems with the exploration of intimacy and love itself, that she's so embarrassed for them. Well, and it's, I'm thinking now of the little previews we've seen for season two, Bill and Jenny in the the lobby of that hotel and Bill going, what was different? Something was different. There's no wires. I, yeah. (laughs) I think it'll play out. I think, I think it's a tease and I think it'll play out differently in the end, but yeah, no, you, you, you make a good point there. Uh, Lester in the, in the, in the previous conversation they had with Bill saying, well, yeah, and Elvis outlasted everyone's criticisms too, just like Charles Darwin did. And Bill just has this long moment where he's processing this information. It's like, you know, the algorithms are ticking away in his head and he goes, exactly. Like, yeah, that's exactly parallel to this situation. Like he has no idea what's happening, but he's just going to go with it because someone isn't yelling at him and, and being outraged at him. Hey, Elvis the pelvis and on the origin of species, they're like this. They are, they are so exactly close. the same. That's pretty much <laughs> the same story. So then we have Libby giving birth in a black hospital. <laughs> Precipitous labor. <laughs> I did. She looked so happy in that last scene where she was holding the baby. And uh, that was nice that she got to have her own little moment there. But I... I it definitely presages a bit of doom or a bit more doom for their relationship that she is sticking this one out on her own and is really 
wanting to have those first few moments with her child be totally uninterrupted by Bill and his multitude of personal problems and emotional things. I don't need your unhappiness to ruin this, so I'm not going to call you for a few hours. I hope that's okay. Yeah, it's it's a pretty clear premonition or forecast of what's going to happen in season two. Like, she's basically going to be raising this kid on her own, so she might as well spend the, the first few hours with it alone. Well, and I think, too, it shows how much that they have already separated themselves from each other because they are already quite separated and in different spheres. But at this point, you know, he's not even aware that she is giving birth, much less present in the hospital. And and how, how different this is from the pilot episode when she tells Ginny at the NICU benefit, you know, Bill really needs to have a child. He It would ground him in a big way. And here she just flat out rejects the idea of even involving him in the first place. Well, I think, too, it comes back to what she said a couple episodes ago when she was telling Bill about how she actually got pregnant. You know, it it's something that she needed. It's something that was purely for her, even if she didn't realize it at the time. And she kept saying, you know, this is going to bring Bill and I closer together. This is going to be, you know, something that we can love. No, this is, honey, this is all you. This is your, your being that you basically willed into force via some handy technology and a sample of your husband's sperm. But it's, I I have, I have a strong feeling that that lesson, if it is a lesson indeed, uh, is going to stick for season two. I have a feeling that she's going to expect him to be involved in a way that he is not prepared to be involved. No, I agree. It's not like she's just going to cut him out, but I think she does realize that this is more than something she wanted as opposed to something she wanted for both of them that's true if that makes any sense no that that's uh, that's absolutely right I bet do we want to talk about Bill and Barton in the bar yeah sure I don't know if you saw this scene this way but this seems to be the scene that sends Bill into a spiral of action because until that point he's he's still trying to wrap his head around the fact that he actually got fired for this genius study which was going to open all of these doors for him and get this Nobel Prize and, and so I think it's really Barton's words you know I'm going to I'm going to do this thing and it's going to be radical and it sounds insane, but it's just going to make everything work. And obviously these are not words that would resonate with Bill in many capacities 99% of the time, but this is the one moment that 1% where Bill is actually listening. And I think here's some of it and here's what are you going to do? And it clicks something in his very, very twisted, fraught state of mind. See, and I, I, you saw it that way. I think I saw more of a parallel, like more of an interesting contrast, we'll say, to the pilot episode when Barton is telling Bill, you cannot do this study. This is too extreme. This is going to, you know, you're going to be a pariah in the medical community. The risks outweigh the rewards too much. And here it's flipped on its head. Barton has been through a lot this season. He wants to fix his marriage. He wants to be close to his wife and his family again in a in a better way and he says I don't care about the risks of electroshock therapy the rewards outweigh the risks so much and I think you could take that as both an impetus for Bill to you know attach himself even more deeply to the study and its risks and rewards as well as going out and reaching for Jenny and all the risks and rewards that that a relationship with her brings interesting I like that take on it it was nice to see Bill and Barton sort of having that father-son relationship again and, and and getting past mostly the blackmail and the betrayal from earlier in the season, you know, and when uh, in, in episode five, when Libby had the miscarriage, Barton's, you know, Barton tells Bill how sorry he is, but it, it's, it feels kind of cold and detached and here, you know, it feels like their relationship has come together again and it's warmer and a little bit more sympathetic than it was before. So I think Bill's gesture of making sure that Barton didn't get fired. I think that that gesture, even beyond the blackmail, maybe elevated him more in Barton's eyes than anything else that's happened. Just because obviously, you know, here's a buddy willing to take a bullet for me on something that matters. I yeah. think that, that seemed to be obviously not the the one thing that will heal all of the the problems they've had in their friendship but it definitely goes a long way towards restoring some of that Mm -hmm. i don't think i have any more notes on bill and barton you want to move on to the last scene let's do it all right so this is it this is down to the wire this is the last one oh man i had forgotten how how like for some reason this final scene just 
I, I have to watch it between my fingers. It's just so like, I don't know the way it's framed or the way the dialogue plays out. It just feels like something really tense is going to happen. And then it doesn't. Are you it kind as of far as like physical movie? action? I mean, I'm sorry, say that again. I'm trying to, because I didn't really get that vibe from it myself, so I'm trying to figure out, do, did you think it was going to be, like, some sort of psychological thriller kind of deal? No, I guess it was just, without the logical resolution to him showing up on her doorstep, like, it ends on Jenny having to make a decision, and it ends on her expression, and it's not very welcoming, like, it's very ambiguous, and you're left with this question in your mind of whether or not she's going to let him in. We know from the season two previews that she will, but it just leaves so much undone that it creates its own, it creates like a metatextual tension hmm. that left me uneasy. See, I wasn't necessarily uneasy about it. I was more stunned and a little bit amused, frankly, because... Once again, Jenny's reward uh, for being a trooper and sticking out banishment and embarrassment is his emotional honesty as much as he's capable of delivering anyway. Well, yeah, yeah, you could read it that way. Or, you know, it's the fact that, uh, you know, she, she put all the work into the study. She put herself and her body and her she compromised herself in the study and and she earns this this little bit of credit. This little bit of private credit <laughs> coming off of a very bleak moment. That's true. Yeah, it's it's, it's going to be small potatoes. And I wonder if she's going to call him out on the fact that he put her the footage of her up during the presentation. Like, I, I feel like that's a pretty big point of contention. And if they don't address that, that's going to be a little strange. I think it's going to be a major point of contention. Between that and, the, and Bill's little invasion of Lillian's question... Oh, I've been using the royal we. <laughs> yes, that's just me. I'm very East Coast, if you don't know. <laughs> I think those two things are going to come back and bite him. <laughs> you know, if, if, if he can't help it. Usually he, uh, he makes preemptive strikes against any kind of callings out, but we'll see. Yeah, I don't know. I think this scene, it just, the way that it played, Wasn't so it? many people, Go ahead. so many people talk about it being romantic comedy-esque where someone just shows up in the rain and flings themselves at the, the feet of their beloved, you know, I, do whatever you want with me, I love you, I I don't know, I just, I didn't get that vibe from this scene, but I also didn't get the, the tension that, that you're talking about, that sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop. Did you think it, you thought it was inevitable? I did. You know, even having not finished the biography at the time, it was just one of those things it just, it seemed to me like it was the rubber bands, you know, it had already been completely stretched out and now it's just snapping back and we're waiting for the inevitable crash when, once again, Bill and Jenny are there together. Yeah, maybe tension isn't the right word. Maybe it's the ambiguity. And I don't mean just the ending, because I think it was pretty clear that she had made her choice. I guess what I mean by the ambiguity was, it's not so much tension as it is ambiguity of their dialogue. So, and what I specifically mean is when there's, there's that exchange about um, no one believes in the work, well, you know, we do. And then I have nothing to offer you. That's okay. What are they talking about? Like, when you normally see, like, you're talking about the whole showing up in the rain thing is a romantic movie trope. Mm -hmm. Usually when that happens, it's very obvious, direct language. You know, I love you. Take me back. Blah, blah, blah. Here it's, I, I've had a long time to unpack exactly what they're saying to each other. And I still think it's almost like they're having two conversations at once. Does that make sense? Like they it can't does. they can't really bring themselves to say exactly what like it's there's a subtextual conversation going on, but it's almost like they're superficially just talking about the work, but then there's a deeper level to it that I don't think is fully finished and won't be until season 2 airs. And see, I I guess I didn't really think about that duality because Obviously, you know, these are two people, two characters who they aren't going to run out into the rain and, you know, I love you, I love you so much, blah, blah, blah. It, 
it's not going to be the notebook. It's not going to be, <laughs> a, a, I forget what Nicholas Sparks calls them exactly, but it's love tragedies. It's, it's not so clear and so well defined. Exactly. You know? Yeah. It's obviously, they are having multiple conversations, but at the same time, because Bill and Jenny are so very similar in some ways, even though they're so different in others, it didn't really, it didn't take me off guard when they were having this very guarded conversation amid what would normally be such a raw moment. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Because it, it really, I mean, I was on the edge of my seat, not because I didn't know what they were going to do, but just because, you know, this was as close to a meeting of the minds as we're going to get as far as talking about, okay, these are the things that we want. These are the things that we're willing to do to get them. Here I am at your door. Well, we will find out in just a few days. Do we want to go on and talk about our predictions for season two? Yeah, we're going to talk for a few minutes about what we think is going to happen, what we hope is going to happen in season two. So if you are listening still, if you've put up with us for this long and you don't want to be spoiled, because we're going to talk about stuff that has to do with real things that happen in the biography and the likelihood of those things happening. So if you're trying to remain spoiler free, you might want to turn the episode off because we're going to get into some stuff that that actually did happen. And I, I feel like is probably very very likely to happen uh, on the show at some point. So be advised of that. So we'll give you a little space to turn it off and go reconsider your life decisions. We still love you, spoiler-free friends. We still love you, but get out. (laughs) Okay, so here we go. Everyone who's still sticking around, we're clearly the better fans because we already know what's going to happen, and we're just fangirling about the fact that shit's going to go down. It's all happening. It's all happening. It's all happening. Okay. Do you want to start or do you want me to start? Lay it on me. You okay. first. So uh, in the biography, very early on, there's there's a lot of stuff. Um, Ginny, the real Ginny did not know that uh, Bill was the one with oligospermia. Um, she really did believe that it was Libby's infertility problem for a long time because when pressed on the issue, she said something like, um, no, it was really difficult not to get pregnant with Bill. And it's never directly addressed, but it's kind of hinted that she had a few abortions while she was with him. And that's not any means to like get super excited and happy about the storyline. It's just a means for there to be um, some very interesting drama and abortion portrayed on a cable show in perhaps a way that hasn't been addressed in the past. I feel like this is a time in television history when we can finally, maybe finally, start getting to a point where abortion is seen as more of a um, difficult decision, but sometimes the right decision, depending on the woman and her life, rather than a reason to feel miserable for her life choices. If I'm phrasing that at all gracefully, I hope I am. So, well, I hope it, I hope they kind of get into that. I think they will, honestly. Um, and it was it was interesting to me because I was reading this morning. Um, they were having a lot of, of talk about Masters of Sex, what with the uh, Emmy nomination news mm-hmm. and many different TV retrospectives that I happened to read this week. Uh, and they there was one article that I read that came out of I, it may have even been Time Magazine. I might have to double check on that, but it was basically uh, the top. 25 shows that have really changed perspectives on female sexuality. And one of them was an episode of Maud, which I don't know if anyone has watched, but Maud is one of the spinoffs of uh, All in the Family with uh, Bea Arthur as the central character. Very feminist, very not strident because that strikes a negative tone, but very independent independent and self-assured in a way that a lot of older female characters weren't portrayed at the time and even now. Mm -hmm. Um, But they actually had an abortion storyline on that show in the first season, which I had forgotten about. Fascinating. Um, Yeah, so Bea Arthur in Maud in the first season gets pregnant, and although she has a grown daughter who at that point was either in maybe end of high school or beginning of college, I can't remember the timeline, But anyway, so she gets pregnant and she decides to have an abortion rather than keep the child as a, you know, 40 something year old mother, which I thought was kind of fascinating. So that's interesting. uh, Like you were saying earlier, I hope they take that route and make it not about the terror of getting an abortion and being a terrible person, but making this very 
important choice for whatever personal considerations they think necessary. Yeah. And just my little personal quirk, I think for once it would be really interesting for them to flip the trope of the man not understanding that a woman is hinting at herself being pregnant and have him like try to like hint around it and then be like, okay, do, do you not see where I'm going with this? Like, I, th- I think this could be the kind of show that would choose to do something like that, considering how much the writers seem to get a kick out of turning tropes on their heads. You remember how you haven't eaten anything for days. <laughs> you are probably pregnant. We have had sex literally every day for the last six weeks with no complications or situations. Do you not think that's strange? You do one of yours. I want to hear one of yours. Okay, well, I, I have two that I am interested to see where they go. Um, I mentioned earlier how Bo Bridges and Alice and Janney are committed to different shows, so very likely we will see much less of them. Yeah, that's but too bad. Alice and Janney also did an interview on Ellen uh, a couple months back where she talked about how she and Bo had to film a very awkward sex scene uh, for Masters of Sex, and so... Yikes. I just, I cannot wait to see this, like, attempt at reconnection and just the awkwardness of whatever is about to start happening because I find it funny and I'm a terrible person. (laughs) Oh, gosh. I think I'd just be biting my nails in terror over something like that. Like, the the previous stuff for episode three and the way the critics have been very vaguely mentioning it have just got me, oh, God. If it turns into, like, a consent and rape thing, I don't know what I'm going to do. If it turns into one of those, I'm going to be angry. But I, I, I will be out and out pissed. I will be very <laughs> betrayed. But I, I don't think that will happen. Not really. I think the writers are way too sophisticated for something like that. This isn't a Game of Thrones scenario. Or at least for it to be real. Like, I want, if, if there is anything like that, because we've seen some violent looking previews, if it does turn into something like that, I really want it to be a storytelling twist and for them to have negotiate, like, actually have negotiated it and, like, hashed out exactly what was going to happen. And then you flash back and see that it was consensual. And even though that's weird, like, to get to that point would be groundbreaking TV. Hey, S and M on pay cable. <laughs> Why not? What more could we ask for? Exactly. <laughs> so can I can I do another one of mine? Go for it. I really there's a, a line there's a section in the in the biography and all mine pertain to stuff that happened in the biography. I'm just crazy about the biography. Um Libby would leave for the summer. She would pack up all their kids even Jenny's kids, and she would go to Michigan to visit her family for the summer and just, like, rent out a cabin on a lake or something and just spend three months out there. And when she did that, Jenny just moved in with Bill. (laughs) And they would just, like, live together for several months and live and breathe and cohabitate. And the neighbors started catching on, which is really funny. Wasn't there a line in the biography about how the neighbors would see Jenny just out lounging by the master's pool? Like, where they would both be wearing matching robes and just sitting out there with the breakfast table, you know, (laughs) hanging out, half naked. (laughs) Not really concerned about being found out, those two. Just waving at the neighbors. How you doing? Yep, it's us. Hey, Bob, what's going on? (laughs) I know we're great. Yep. So uh, I, I hope things come to that because that, that is an excellent detail. Like that is just the kind of uh, just throwing, throwing it in other people's faces. Like there's this whole element to their storyline. We have to keep this secret at all costs. You know, if this gets out, it is just going to ruin us. It is going to ruin the whole study. But for them to take like part of it and just be like, ah, eh, fuck it. We'll do whatever the hell we want. Like that's, that's incredibly funny to me. <laughs> it's such an interesting role reversal because as much as they didn't talk about it and wouldn't put it you know out in public in front of the cameras is sort of that kind of common knowledge but then behind the scenes like you say eh, the neighbors can see both of us in states of disarray that doesn't matter like I kind of want to I I kind of want it to get to the point where they're just they they look around and they realize that no one is calling them out on this or not as much as they thought people would so they just start like flouting the rules and kind of like pushing people are like hey look at us going back to Libby I think one of my predictions for this season from from some of the clips that I've seen and a lot of the still photographs I'm wondering if we're going to get a postpartum depression storyline for her because in a lot of her scenes and in a lot of the interviews that Caitlin Fitzgerald has given it seems as if Libby is pretty much emotionally done and 
although she is still trying to get Bill in on this this whole family life and having a child and providing for this child. I don't know. I'm just, I'm interested. I would be interested to see that kind of storyline go down. I could definitely see that. I think that's a very astute observation. And I, it would be a nice change, I think, for, for us as an audience to see instead of, you know, sweet Karen Libby who is very selfless and who doesn't want to make waves. I would just love for that to be a complete 180 and for Libby to be like, look, I am screwed up right now and you just have to deal with it. Yeah, although I I continue to hope that they don't, like I'm seeing her as she takes this dark turn, I'm seeing Betty Draper in her and I really want, I really want them to do something different with her altogether. Yeah, I mean, but at the same time, it it can't be a Betty Draper because, you know, in Mad Men, Betty is so completely ignorant of anything that Don does, whereas I think Libby definitely is much more incisive when it comes to Bill, but she's just angry about it. I think the main difference between Betty and Libby is they both have the exact same first name, only they have different uh, diminutive forms of it, which is, boy. Betty, on the whole, like fundamentally, there is something missing from her life that she'll always be looking for, whereas Libby knows what it is that she wants that would make her happy it just eludes her constantly like she knows it's right within her grasp and then it disappears right yeah I agree I think Libby is much more self-aware in knowing what she wants and knowing what's missing as opposed to Betty who just you know doesn't even have really the language or the I don't understanding is the wrong word but you know what I mean she just can't even verbalize what is is wrong with her life Mm -hmm. do you want me to read off the next one even though it's yours I think it's fascinating yeah go for it so there's in the biography Bill is well known for treating very famous clients and I think some of the notable ones like in as far as his fertility work he worked with the Shah of Iran and his wife Oh, which would just be life. which would just be nuts. That would be nuts if that was if that was a thing on this show. And then when it came to the sexual dysfunction, I think he worked with Barbara Eden, who played Jeannie on I Dream of Jeannie in the mid sixties. He did, and then he worked with um, was it George Wallace, uh, the pres- <gasps> or the oh yes, the presidential Al- candidate? Was it? Who- wasn't he in a wheelchair at one point? I think maybe that was. Yeah, because after there, there was an attempt on his life, yeah. I think sometime during his now failed presidential campaign, but I think that was what put him out permanently was the, that attempt on his life because that was what put him in the wheelchair. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, I really hope they get some, some famous people. You know, uh, it'd, be, it'd be interesting to see who they would pick to play someone like Barbara Eden given how iconic she is. But even if they, if they chose, like, a uh, lesser-known actor or actress, I still think that they could – kind of do the same thing so that would be really cool well and honestly i would love if they didn't go hollywood if they did something like the shah of iran because that way we you have such a great culture clash right at a time when all of that was about to shift I mean, politically and oh that would be great yeah that would be really cool one of my sad predictions for season two is that lillian is going to die before the work is finished oh i will be heartbroken i <laughs> the if, podcast if, will be full of my tears no oh. If that does happen, I will be curious to know how her pap smear program would be carried on or if it would just disappear. Because obviously, you know, she wants Jenny to be her successor. That's not happening. I, I, oh, it's, uh, they cast Dr. Papa Nicolau. That's right, they did. Do you remember who? I cannot, pre- I will botch his last name because it is complicated, but I think it's pronounced Rene Aubergenois. Yes. Probably okay. not right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> Apologies. But uh, he, Dr. Papa Nicolau is the man for whom the pap smear is named. That is what pap is, Papa Nicolau. So he will be he, showing up at some point. And I think it's interesting that earlier in the season, he's described as not being DePaul's mentor. But the fact that they've cast him, it means he's, you know, obviously very significant in her life, I would assume. So that would be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any other predictions you would like to see come true this season? I think, hmm. Oh, I know which one. I harp on about this, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway, even though everyone's heard it a million times. I want that Vicuña coat to show up. <laughs> I, Vicuña! 
I have got a crazy hankering for an expensive coat. Just because I think it could really be a, a funny source of like weirdness. Like because um, Vicuña is a a cousin of the alpaca um, and the llama. It's a type high of in the Andes. high in the Andes mountains. They are these big. Um, ungulates, I guess, and they grow very, very, very soft uh, fur and hair. And vicuña is even softer than cashmere and more precious and 10 times more expensive. Even like nowadays, a vicuña coat will cost you about $20,000. And at some well, point... Well, vicuñas at this point are not... In, I don't know what they're classified as endangered or, you know, on that... They're scale, very rare. They're, they're very depleted, shall we say. Yeah. And even like even today you can find vintage ones for a very, very high price because they're it's it's like saving grandma's fur if it's in good condition. But it's not it's not um, animal cruelty to the point of having a fur because all their it's like a it's like a felt uh, material or like a cashmere, like a woven kind of hair, I suppose. So he gives her this Vicuña cape. And in the book, her reaction is to be kind of smug about it and show it off to people at the PTA meeting and essentially break Libby's heart by kind of showing it off in public. But given how much uh, Ginny is cash strapped in season two, because she starts selling diet pills and apparently she's being threatened with having her car repossessed, I think the introduction of a coat, the value, the same value as a house could be really interesting. Like, why would you buy me a coat? Like, why can't you buy me a car? Why don't you pay off my title? Why don't you pay off all my debts and, and, and pay me money? Why don't you pay my wages? So I just, I, I have, I have magical dreams of there being a god awful expensive coat this season. It is my, it is my truest wish. I would love to see Vicuña coat, only so I can keep saying the word Vicuña. Isn't it a great word? Oh, uh, Vicuña. It's, it's so a fun Spanish. one. So tiny. Yes. Yeah, really, I don't have any more pressing predictions for season two other than I guess Ethan will finally get to Disneyland and no one will care. I can't wait until we're done with Ethan. I'm so over him. <laughs> I'm already running victory laps around my house. I have victory lap, all caps, fingers up. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So we will find out um, this coming Sunday whether or not any of our predictions and hopes and dreams come true and are addressed this season. Um, Until then, we'll be starting new uh, episodes. Uh, We'll work out a schedule of some kind, but we will be doing um, some kind of commentary for the new episodes. So we'll see you after the season premiere. Thanks for sticking with us for a whole season. Yes. Thanks, everyone. uh, And we'll see you next time. Bye.